uh, for this forum uh, I will introduce now, but this is continuing uh, uh, the theme of autonomous systems. This uh, forum brings together this panel of, of experts to discuss developments in autonomous technologies for unmanned aircraft and uh, space exploration systems and autonomous ships and self-driving vehicles. And so we're very fortunate to have these experts who will be able to give their domain uh, experience and understandings and also be able to cut across the kind of autonomous systems activity. We have Raj Rajkumar as the George Westinghouse professor at Carnegie Mellon University. We have uh, James Billingham, who is the director for the Center for Marine Robotics at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. We have Claire Tomlin, who is the Charles A. DeSueur chair of the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at UC Berkeley. And we have Mimi Ong, who is the Deputy Division Manager of Autonomous Systems at JPL. And Mimi has another uh, title as well. Uh, it's just changed, right, Mimi? OK, anyway, the, the new one is? I became the project manager for Mars Helicopter. Project manager for Mars Helicopter. <laughs> um, many of you probably didn't think we had helicopters on Mars, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, all have extensive experience, by the way, in their sectors, and you can find their complete bios, of course, in, the, in today's program, which are very uh, impressive. And we're very, very fortunate to have uh, uh, Mr. Ali Velchi from NBC News, the anchor there, uh, who is a very well-known journalist and frequent moderator of Academy panels. Um, I, I don't know which number this is, but it's, it's probably in double digits at this point. Uh, and, uh, we're, and he will essentially be in charge of running the panel and handling the Q&A with the panelists and also with the audience subsequently. So, so Ali, really, the floor is yours to lay the whole program out for the audience. Dan, thank you very You're much. You're on the air. Thank you so much. Let me turn my mic on. There we go. One, two, three. There we go. Thank you, Dan. First of all, can everybody at the back hear all, all of us very clearly? Yeah, great. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dan, it is such my honor to be back here uh, among you all, and, and great to see so many familiar faces. We have had uh, already a fairly robust conversation just in preparation for this this morning, so we're going to emulate that. And let me tell you how it's going to work. We'll have brief presentations uh, on the categories that my panelists are experts on uh, land, on the oceans, on air, and on space, autonomy in those areas, and they really are experts on these things. And then we'll have a little discussion among ourselves here to, uh, to answer and compare uh, how things work in these, uh, in these four domains. Then we will uh, take this out to all of you, and you are all so terrific with your questions. Um, and I will ask you to sort of identify yourselves when we come to your questions. There are two mics. You can see them on either side of the room. Line up at the questions. Uh, as I always ask you, you're so terrific, but um, make them questions. Uh, if you can, that'll be great. Uh, I know some of you are just ready to get your thesis approved. Uh, and then, and that's how it's going to go. We will take a break because it's, we'll be here for a while. We will take a break to use the restrooms. Uh, for the women in the crowd, that still continues not to be much of a problem. But for the guys, uh, one has to give some forethought to uh, strategy in getting to the lineup for the restrooms. This is the, one of those places in life where that normal uh, phenomenon is reversed and the guys will be lining up for the bathrooms. Uh, but anyway, we'll make it all work, and we will appreciate the struggles uh, that women go through on a daily basis today. Uh, what I've asked our panelists to do is to give us seven or eight minutes on their topic, and of course, that's not sufficient for any of them, uh, but, but we will leave time to explore other things in our discussion and in the discussion, uh, in the questions that you ask of them. There are no questions that are too dumb, although that's not usually something we encounter here. Um, there are possibly some questions that are too smart, uh, but that's how we'll do it, and by the end of it, we're all gonna understand autonomy on land, in the oceans, in air, and uh, in space. My panelists, uh, you will have information on them, but from uh, my immediate right, uh, Raj Rajkumar is the George Westinghouse professor at Carnegie Mellon University. He'll be talking about land. James Bellingham is the director of uh, marine robotics at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. He'll be talking about uh, the sea and the oceans. Uh, Claire Tomlin is the Charles A. DeSor Chair of Engineering at the University of California, Berkeley. She'll be talking about uh, air. And Mimi Ong is the deputy, well, she's now the head of the uh, Mars Helicopter Project at the NASA, it is still at NASA, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, right? 
All right. I mean, half of us were clapping about that because it's neat, and the other half were like, what is a Mars helicopter? Um, we will learn all about it. Uh, Raj, let's start with you. Let's talk about the autonomy that is probably most familiar to so many of us, the idea of, of autonomy of uh, transportation on land. With your permission, can I go to the podium? Absolutely, yes. In fact, please uh, do that. Our, our presenters will do so from the podium. It's an honor to be here to, uh, to be talking to you about uh, land autonomy, uh, specifically uh, vehicles, uh, passenger vehicles that can uh, drive themselves. Uh, so let me give you kind of a highlight, if you will, by showing this particular uh, video of a vehicle driving itself on a public road uh, and highways. If you look in, into the glass here, you can see uh, a couple of cameras. We use cameras to detect things um, like lane markings, construction zone signs, uh, things like that. Uh, we also use cameras to classify those objects that we, that we um, are tracking. So we know, we know where they are, we know how fast they're moving, and in some cases we want to classify those. So we know if it's a pedestrian, we know if it's a bicycle. Uh, that's me in the back seat trying to live cast the event. The gentleman on the right is actually Bill Schuster, chairman of the U.S. House Transportation Infrastructure Committee, a very powerful committee uh, on the House side of things. Uh, they're actually taking a ride from a community park outside Pittsburgh, driving at about 8 miles per hour through a suburban highway, 45 miles per hour through 11 traffic lights, to, uh, through uh, two interstate highways, alternating between 65 and 75 mile, uh, uh, miles per hour. And then you see they're clearly on the center lane right now, and then uh, shortly likely will change lanes at highway speeds. Uh, shortly likely find its uh, way uh, entrance to the Pittsburgh International Airport, 33 miles away from the point of origin, finds the departure curb, and then gently pulls to the side of the curb. Uh, so let's basically uh, listen to what uh, the chairman has to say after the completion of that 33 mile fully autonomous ride. Oh, yeah. It was excellent. It's amazing. <laughs> did, it, did it without even a hitch. Uh, so it turned out that the uh, chairman was so impressed. I should say the following. This actually happened uh, uh, August of 2013. We are talking about more than four years back now. Uh, fully 33 miles, my fully autonomous ride. Uh, the chairman was so impressed, he actually asked us to bring the vehicle. This is a vehicle that we built at uh, Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. We took the vehicle to Washington, D.C. about uh, eight months later, and then uh, gave uh, autonomous rides around Capitol Hill, and for some, a ride uh, from Capitol Hill down I-395 south, that all of you know, uh, to uh, the Pentagon exit and back, six and a half miles each way, about uh, 20 legislators, officials from the U.S. DOT, as well as officials from the National Science Foundation, our sponsors basically uh, were given rights. Uh, so that's kind of the uh, context. So basically, uh, this technology, if you will, has been around for a while. So let me uh, take a step back and talk about the bigger picture. There has been a lot of uh, discussions and coverage in the media. Uh, there has been a lot of industry activity in trying to make uh, passenger vehicles drive themselves. Right? a lot of activity, and you can see basically based on uh, the video that you saw, the technology seems feasible, seems viable, and such. At the same time, there will be others who will basically say, hey, this is a lot of hyperbole going on, and then uh, not really grounded in reality for you all. So, so where do we stand? I just want to give you a sense for that. So let's first talk about what the benefits of self-driving vehicles can be. Turns out that 1.3 million people die around the world every year from automotive crashes, 1.3 million people. Turns out that about 94% of those crashes are due to human error. Humans get distracted all the time. If instead vehicles can drive themselves, they're not going to be distracted, and therefore those uh, crashes, if you will, can go down from 1.3 million to uh, 130,000 to 13,000, maybe even to 1,300 per year. So it's a big win for society. And secondly, I guess we are in D.C. where uh, traffic is a huge problem. It turns out that uh, we spend enormous amounts of time every year, each one of us, basically being stuck in traffic, waiting for a traffic light, waiting for a traffic jam to clear. And then most vehicles have a single driver in the car, and therefore that's very unproductive time spent. If instead vehicles can drive themselves, we get those uh, commute times, those congestion times, uh, standing very static, uh, to back to, for uh, productive purposes, and therefore, one could strongly argue that global economic productivity will quantifiably increase if basically vehicles can drive themselves. We spend the times in our cars productively. 
Thirdly, the elderly, particularly women, because you live, uh, who live longer than uh, men, basically at some point in time lose enough of their cognitive skills that their driving license is taken away, and which point in time they basically have to uh, be staying at home in empty nest, the uh, spouse has passed away, and have to depend on somebody else for mobility. Right? And basically, uh, depression sets in over time, and then the quality of life goes down dramatically. If instead, vehicles can actually drive them from point A to point B at their command, at their will, basically, uh, they regain their mobility options, regain independence, and therefore their quality of life will go up dramatically. It turns out that uh, beyond the elderly, there are about 1.5 million legally blind people in the US alone, about more than uh, 5 million physically disabled people, none of whom can basically drive, and their quality of life will go, go up dramatically as well. So that's basically the, the promise of self-driving vehicles. Right? This is truly a revolution in the making, will actually change the landscape of transportation as we know it. So the only question then becomes when, right? So let's talk about the challenges it turns out. So I guess, uh, as we have shown in our prototypes and such, uh, the technology is becoming more and more feasible, if you will, but there are fundamental challenges. The first and foremost is that, that the world that we live in, the world that we drive in, basically has, uh, is very uh, uncertain. Uh, basically, any number of unexpected situations can arise on the roads. Uh, as you drive, just take note, uh, you actually may see encounter situations that you, who have been driving for decades, if you will, have not seen before. But, but we still deal with it because we are intelligent creatures, we reason through things, we apply basically common sense, uh, social uh, courtesy, uh, social norms, uh, we basically make eye contact, uh, we actually use hand gestures and so on, and we apply the uh, laws of physics and so on, and therefore we basically, by and large, navigate those situations we have never ever seen before safely. Right? The, then you ask the question, can von Neumann computers, which basically follow a sequence of uh, pre-coded instructions, do the right things in situations that they have never ever seen before? Here is a simple proposition, a simple question. I give you a hardware platform, with sensors, computers, and communication networks, and put a software stack on it, and basically ask the question, can this run safely at all times? Simple question, the answer to it is going to be a long time coming. We are actually, we are nowhere close to basically verifying, validating uh, that particular uh, proposition. Uh, secondly, I guess you could have component failures and such. In aviation, we use a lot of redundancy to actually deal with uh, failures, but we have to deal with economic constraints in, in a physical car. But from an engineering perspective, very, very solvable. Another aspect basically is human factors. How will humans react? Will you, as an individual, be willing to give up control of the draft, the, of the wheel, when you and your family are in the car, and it's basically driving at highway speeds, actually uh, uh, navigating itself through an urban environment with uh, a very dense uh, conglomeration of pedestrians, bicyclists, motorcycles, and so on? Will you feel comfortable for yourself, your family, and uh, the rest of uh, people in the environment, right? We all know that the technologies that we do have can fail, that the crash needs rebooting. Will you be comfortable doing that? Right? Human factors will play a, play a big role. And meanwhile, I mentioned uh, cooperation among individuals, making eye contact, hand gestures, and so on. With uh, communications, uh, with vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, vehicle infrastructure communications, maybe some of that uh, becomes possible as well. So there's still, basically, we have come a long way. Uh, machine learning, as like I said, has come a long way, but it turns out that uh, uh, there's still a much longer way to go. So I guess you can, the glass used to be almost empty, if you will. Now it's basically the glass is half full. There's a lot of uh, excitement in the technology engineering domains that the glass is half full. What I want to to uh, add that uh, the glass is half empty still. So let me basically uh, give you one more sense as well. Uh, here is uh, a vehicle that uh, uh, was created with the exact same technology that you saw in the earlier video, a Cadillac that we had. Uh, the same technology went into this vehicle, was actually this vehicle did its first cross-country drive in, my, in uh, March of 2015 from San Francisco all the way to New York City, a distance of 3,500 miles. It drove itself 98.6% uh, of the time, only on the highways, right? not on the uh, roads when the, uh, uh, the passengers need to basically take a break and such. Right? So the exciting part is that 98.6% of the time it was able to drive itself, the skeptics in us should basically ask, what about the remaining 1.4%? So basically, it turns out that actually we have a big fat cat to traverse, big fat tail to basically traverse. So 
Uh, but we will get there. The question is, is time. It's going to take uh, some number of years. Uh, but incrementally, this automation is beginning to happen. You can buy cars today with uh, lane departure warning, lane keep assist, uh, cross traffic alert, blind zone alert, and so on. It can actually detect and stop pedestrians under ideal conditions. So I guess the, the bottom line I want to wrap up, this uh, is a revolution that is waiting to happen. It is happening incrementally as we speak, right? But be skeptical of the hyperbole out there. But this is going to be, trans I guess, transforming society as we know it, reducing crashes, improving the quality of life, and making our times in the cars a lot more productive. Thank you. All right, I'm going to ask uh, James to come on. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. And you've got a counter there and one on your left. You got it. So I thought what I would do is I would use my little bit of time up here to give you a bit of a feeling for the ocean environment. And then hopefully in the process of our having our conversation up here and your questions, we'll get more into the technology. Uh, I will say that autonomy at sea manifests itself in all three domains, uh, primarily under the water, which is what I'm going to focus on today, but we also have autonomous surface platforms uh, and air vehicles as well. So I, I think that maybe the first question is why do we use robots? And historically we've studied the ocean uh, from ships. It is, however, a dangerous environment for humans, uh, and it is a very large place. It covers two-thirds of the planet, actually over two-thirds of the planet, and ships are expensive, and as a consequence, the ocean is actually largely unexplored and unmapped, and certainly, in a scientific sense, very poorly understood. So we use robots uh, to expand our capabilities, initially to augment ships, and then, to some degree, supplement ships uh, to, to map, uh, explore, and understand the ocean environment. So, if you want to think ocean and robotics, think first exploration robotics. However, there is a challenge. Uh, for all practical purposes, radio does not penetrate the ocean. Uh, the ocean is, uh, uh, contains salt, it's a conductor, and so radio waves basically uh, don't penetrate. So all of our communication tools, our navigation tools that we tend to rely on in the terrestrial and in the air environment go away. Uh, so our untethered vehicles in the ocean environment must be autonomous. Uh, so uh, we like to say, think autonomous or die. <laughs> so beneath, uh, beneath those uh, surface waves, uh, the ocean is a swirling, complex environment. Uh, this is a region off of California, and the circular current structures are about 100 kilometers across. Uh, these are eddies. Uh, this is a moving, uh, changing environment, and it's home to most of the life on the planet. Uh, by the way, life we understand very poorly. Uh, we would like to be able to predict this environment, partly as a measure of our understanding and partly just because we need to. But to do so requires we resolve the subsurface structure. And the best way we know how to do this is to use robots, lots of robots. Uh, the observations that drove this model vis visualization were actually more than a dozen robots operating over a period of more than a month. So if you think ocean robotics, also think lots of robotics. So what is different in the ocean environment? Well, it's a strange place. Uh, it's big, deep, on average about sort of almost four kilometers. Uh, it's mostly very dark and it is full of surprises. Uh, it's largely, as I said, unmapped, uh, and there's no Google ski, uh, street maps uh, for the ocean. So, uh, so these are images of a hydrothermal vent site. The creatures here live off of heat and chemical energy from the interior of the Earth. They are unaware that the sun even exists. They were discovered in the 1970s. So the ocean is full of surprises. I'm going to show you in my next slide uh, a video taken by a colleague of mine who attaches tags to various animals, turtles and sharks, uh, and then follows them with the robot to see how they uh, behave in the underwater environment. Uh, but I think my favorite video of hers is the one time she put a camera on her vehicle facing backwards. So let's, uh, let's take a look and see what happens there. So here's her little robot. It's diving below the surface waves. You can already see there's a fish there. A little while later, a whole school of fish 
my biologist friends have absolutely no idea why this is happening. After all, we're operating in shark-infested waters, so why do they think this little robot is their mom? Uh, what's more, uh, you know, and this happens a lot actually, I've gotten robots back which have shark teeth in them. Uh, apparently sharks have some sort of robot catch and release program. And uh, <laughs> we just, we just, you know, when you go back through the data, you realize that these robots are getting bumped all the time. We just, we just hadn't noticed. So surprises. So what's in the future? Well, these are two vehicles that, that uh, are developed with a team out on the west coast at Ambari. The one in the back is about a 500 kilogram vehicle. Uh, it operates over about 100 kilometers. Uh, it costs several million dollars uh, and it requires a ship. You deploy it in the morning and maybe you recover it and recharge batteries and deploy again the, the next day. The vehicle in the front is sort of vintage 10 years later, so that was a back of the envelope schedule uh, 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 vehicle in 2007. Uh, and that vehicle actually can run for three weeks, at least in the ocean. It can cover uh, 1,800 miles. It doesn't need a ship. Uh, we operate it at the end of a satellite link. So one thing in our future is robots operating in effect uh, on their own, or teams of robots operating out there on, the, on their own. So another thing that we think is coming is smarter robots. So one of the things humans are good at is surprise. Uh, we recognize when something's different. It's been a difficult challenge uh, for robots. So here's a robot, Yogi Girdar uh, actually developed this for his PhD thesis, which is running a form of machine learning which is actually very light. It can actually be run, it can actually be run on the platform. And when it encounters an environment which it hasn't seen before, which doesn't fit its growing classification scheme, it's surprised. And you can see those red dots there in the right screen, which are the surprising uh, things to the robot. And in fact, uh, the way Yogi programmed this is when it encounters something surprising, it concentrates its measurements there, just to the way you would expect a human scientist might. It finds the diver surprising, surprising there. So these are in their infancy, but uh, this is a part of a, a development that's very exciting to me, applicable to a broad range of problems, for example, reliability. Uh, there's a lot of things that happen when you're <laughs> running a vehicle, uh, which are surprising. <laughs> okay. And my last slide here is to say that uh, industry and the defense have growing use, uses for robots as well. Uh, this shows infrastructure in the Gulf of Mexico supporting oil and gas extraction. So oil and gas fundamentally depends on their robots to prepare, inspect, repair, uh, uh, repair operate, and eventually decommission equipment they put in the offshore environment. And some of these, particularly in deeper waters, are surface platforms that lead to almost an entire city of hardware on the seafloor. Um, I call this urban ocean. So as industries like oil and gas and aquaculture, wind power, telecoms, uh, mineral extraction, uh, and so as those increase their ocean footprint, they increase our dependence on robots. And there's an interesting challenge here for the scientific community. A lot of the technology that finds their way into this space uh, has been developed for understanding the ocean, and at the same time, it's now being applied uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, in effect, uh, moving into the ocean for commercial and uh, for defense reasons. And I don't have a slide for it. I'll just say that when we get to the discussion, session, you should ask Mimi and I about Ocean Worlds. Thank you. Claire? Claire Tomlin. Thank you, and um, thank you for inviting me to come and talk about autonomy in air. I'd like to start by talking about air traffic control. Now, this is a snapshot of um, commercial aircraft above the United States at a certain point in time. And then I've also um, uh, pulled out a little bit a movie of the high altitude traffic in part of the Oakland Center, which is the part of the airspace under which I live. And um, it's showing several hours of traffic moving um, high above the the um, airports in the Oakland Center. Some of them are coming in to land and some of them are leaving. And I'd like to sort of start by saying that this airspace is regulated by the Federal Aviation Administration. 
And there's a group of air traffic controllers that are monitoring and talking to all of the pilots in the air traffic control system at any given instant. And so in this, um, in this plot, you can see either in the snapshot these blue areas or the, the kind of pink areas outlined in the movie. These are sectors of airspace. And the whole of the United States is divided up into these sectors of airspace. Each sector is controlled by a single air traffic controller, sits on the ground, and um, receives information about the air traffic control system from the radar feed. And I should say that I have this movie on playback, so at, at some point all of the aircraft disappear, and then, and then they appear again. That's not because the aircraft are falling out of the sky, that's just the, the data that we're showing here. Also, you see some of the aircraft disappearing, for an instant, that's because they're going in lower altitude, so we're only showing the aircraft over 35,000 feet here. Um, but the controller is responsible for guiding each aircraft from just before the entry of the uh, sector through the sector to just before it leaves the sector. And the primary goal of air traffic control is to keep the aircraft separated. So you see in this, this picture a kind of stylized view of the separation standards. Aircraft, if they're away from busy airports, they have to stay separated by five nautical miles laterally and 1,000 feet vertically. So it's like a virtual hockey puck flying around each aircraft. And so air traffic controllers tend to um, be a little conservative and tend to make sure that the procedures that they adopt to route aircraft through these sectors um, ensure safety of the system, ensure the aircraft stays separated while going from origin to destination. The aircraft themselves are very highly automated. I think you probably all know this. And they have been automated for a long time. So the, in the, the 70s, we're flying aircraft, fly-by-wire, that are using autopilots, that basically the, the pilots are hands-off. They program in what they want the aircraft to do, and it basically follows the autonomous directions. Um, and there's an autopilot, there's, um, there's sort of more sophisticated automation over the years. Now aircraft have flight management systems which talk to the autopilots. But basically, the key thing here is that there's always a certified pilot in the loop. So the air traffic controller talks to the pilots, and the pilots interact with the control system on board. They press buttons, they invoke modes for the aircraft to fly these routes autonomously, but the, the pilot is there in the loop. And that's for the simple reason that we don't know how to automate all the things against all the things that could possibly happen to these aircraft. So we, as control engineers, don't understand everything that could happen, and we need a pilot there in the loop to take over if there's a situation that um, comes up that hasn't been pre-programmed for. So as I said, the key thing that an air traffic controller does is to make sure that the aircraft stay separated from each other. Um, and so they, they have, um, it's, it's, it's a very interesting um, field to then try to look at what does an aircraft look like under air traffic control. And it, it's interesting when you think about the kind of automation that's been built up on aircraft. So, so autopilots and flight management systems are basically built to mimic the way that pilots would have flown the aircraft if they were flying it manually. They simplify the task, a complex task of flying an aircraft, into sequences of well-defined modes. So change altitude, change airspeed, they sequence together these rules. And so under air traffic control, if you, if you think, and this is a, a lot of the work that we're doing at Berkeley, is to try to think how do we start to introduce some automation into the air traffic control, the ground control functionality. Um, it becomes a problem of thinking about these groups of aircraft under air traffic control and how you might um, design automation which guarantees that the aircraft stay separated with a human in the loop, which actually makes the, um, the automation design, I think, even more challenging. 
And so what, um, what tends to happen under air traffic control is that a typical controller on a typical day managing about 12 to 15 aircraft will group aircraft together by potential conflict. So for example, in this diagram, you see a sort of stylized grouping together. The most critical group of aircraft are the ones that are coming together at that, at that point, and the controller has to spend most of his or her cognitive time figuring out how to either slow one of the aircraft down or speed it up or take it through a detour or in kind of the worst case, put an aircraft on a holding pattern so that the aircraft stay separated. And controllers are great at this. They, um, they pride themselves in trying to resolve conflicts by touching the minimum number of aircraft the minimum number of times. And so when we think about automation, and I think this is my, my second main point, is that it's in this system, it seems that the best thing to do is to take the rules of the road that currently exist, look at how air traffic controllers have evolved the system, and try to develop an automation scheme which adheres to that, which adheres to this idea of um, simplicity so that it's, um, so that it's easy to be or easier to be a human in the loop. And they do things like, um, you know, the airspace structure is set up so that if, um, if there are many aircraft, you try to line them up flying at the same speed along the same jetways so you can treat many aircraft like, like one aircraft. So it's, a, it's an exciting time in air traffic control and it's really become exciting in the last 10 years. Um, because there's a lot more um, demand now um, from, say, some large companies thinking about how they want to use the airspace. And so one of these directions is looking at the growing number of UAV applications. And one of the projects that we're working on is trying to understand how one would take um, the current air traffic control system and adapt it and modify it to allow for UAV operations. And so some of the questions that we're looking at are how much of the current architecture do we want to maintain? Um, there's still going to be a human in the loop for UAV um, traffic management or UTM, but, um, but it's a much more autonomous system. These vehicles are flying basically a, a autonomously with a human in the loop on the ground. And, um, and how much of the current system in terms of the airspace structure and in terms of the control mode structure on board the aircraft should be maintained as we move forward. And finally, if we look at kind of the new vistas, this is something that's up and coming. I think it's a very exciting, is the idea of um, even um, introducing even more autonomy into the airspace through personal air mobility. So these are flying cars. And I think many of you have seen what's going on. There's companies that are developing flying cars. And here I show a couple of examples, and there are more. Um, on the top left is um, a company that is affiliated with Google. And then the top right is also a company affiliated with Google, both designing um, vehicles that are quite different. But on the left, it's a vehicle that could um, drive and then take off and fly and come back in and basically park in a parking spot. Um, in the bottom left, this is an Aeromobilis Slovakian company that's actually built a vehicle and, um, and its wings fold in. So it can also drive, park, but then it can drive and then take off once its wings are out. Um, and then the bottom right is a German company. I, I love the design of this aircraft um, because it's um, basically a whole lot of little motors and it's a VTOL, so it takes off vertically and then it's, um, its motors uh, switch direction and then it can fly forward. So there's been a lot of work in the design of these new um, basically electric aircraft. Um, and I think the big questions now are, how do uh, we design the airspace operations for these? They're promoted as vehicles that will allow us to get from one side of a mega city to another very quickly, but the current um, regulations, um, at least in the United States, don't allow for this, um, this kind of personal air mobility. And how do, we, how do we think about the introduction of these vehicles, which are by design autonomous? So the person who's in the cockpit is just a regular person like you and me that doesn't necessarily, is not necessarily a certified pilot. Um, so with that, I'd, I'd like to conclude and thank you very much. Thank you.
Mimi. Mimi on. So thank you for inviting me to this meeting of the uh, NAE meeting and a chance to, opportunity to participate in this panel, uh, specifically because it's on the topic that I'm very passionate about, uh, autonomy in space exploration. Um, next, oh, next chart, it's me, okay. So the need for autonomy in space uh, is driven uh, primarily, first and foremost, by the large distances at which we operate our spacecraft. So, uh, and of course, the associated um, uh, long uh, one-way light times that come with it. So, example, the spacecraft at Mars. Mars, uh, distance from Earth ranges anywhere from half uh, astronomical, uh, astronomical units to 2.5 AUs, depending on where the planets are as they orbit about the sun. Uh, the, to communicate with the spacecraft at that distance, the one-way light time ranges from 4 minutes to 12 minute, uh, 21 minutes. Saturn, further out, uh, eight and a half to 10 and a half AUs out there. One way light time to communicate uh, ranges from 74 to 84 minutes. So with that kind of uh, significant one way light time, the continuous you know, ground in the loop, uh, close communication, control navigation of spacecraft uh, simply is not possible. Uh, instead, we track the spacecraft from the Earth uh, to the deep space network and we track these spacecraft once per day to once per many days to sometimes as long as once per many months uh, when the spacecraft in hibernation. So between these relatively infrequent communication with our spacecraft, the spacecraft have to operate uh, autonomously on a nominal basis. So next, that's the you know, fundamental uh, basic autonomy needed. But as spacecraft are going to operate in uh, unknown a priori environments and uh, highly dynamic environments uh, in you know, short times, short, du short durations, um, no uh, participation from the ground activity is possible. So a perfect example of this is the uh, landing of the Curiosity rover that I believe you're all familiar with at Mars. Uh, I'd like to show you the animation of the sequence of events uh, and with the thought that the entire sequence is totally autonomous and uh, it, the, from the beginning to end is uh, about five minutes duration. So the descent stage separates from the crew and is autonomously entering the atmosphere of Mars. It's going through the different transformations that's required for the vehicle to decelerate appropriately. this, again, it's you know, less than five minutes of a sequence, all of the, the, the spacecraft has to make all the measurements of its state in situ with the in situ sensors and be reacting and commanding the engines and the thrusters on board and executing the sequences necessary for this soft landing, all of it fully autonomously. So the next level of autonomy, and that's now the Mars helicopter where uh, we are uh, developing a capability for autonomous flight in thin air of uh, Mars atmosphere. Okay, so uh, not only, you know, you can't just stop if you're flying, you can't just stop and say, I'm in trouble, you know, Earth help, definitely, you gotta finish flying, you gotta land, get to a safe place, uh, so high level autonomy needed. Uh, so uh, at Mars, a helicopter can fly ahead of a rover or astronauts uh, to scout ahead and um, help them um, you know, get high definition image back of the destinations that the rover or humans want to traverse and give I information of where they can go. Uh, a, a helicopter can get to places uh, that rovers and humans can't go. So um, I think you know this, I just want, please let, let me state the obvious. Human beings have never flown a helicopter or a rotorcraft in any other planet outside of uh, our own uh, Earth's atmosphere. So, it's a very exciting project that I'm on. And uh, so, to fly a helicopter at Mars, the environment, uh, first atmosphere, uh, is very thin. Uh, the atmospheric density at Mars is 1% of that at Earth's. 
Okay. On top of that, uh, the Mars has very cold nights. So whatever vehicle that we build has to survive the cold nights and be able to you know, operate, survive and operate during the day. Uh, the gravity over there is about 40% uh, of Earth's. That helps um, because uh, it allows us to uh, you know, uh, fly more mass. So uh, to fly a helicopter in this thin air, basically you need to get a big blade, optimize it for lift, spin it fast, and make sure the vehicle is light. So, um, so for the system that we're developing, it's a 1.5 meter diameter rotor. Okay, so, and uh, we picked an airfoil uh, that's optimized uh, for uh, lift in thin atmospheric density. And uh, by spinning it up to about 2,800 uh, revolutions per minute, uh, we can lift up to 1.8 uh, kilograms of mass. Okay. So uh, besides uh, lift, we need to, um, the vehicle needs to be autonomous on Mars. So first, it has to be able to autonomously follow waypoints uh, of a trajectory that we command ahead of time. Again, because of the long one-way light time, uh, joysticking from Earth is not possible. Uh, second, it has to be autonomous in that it has to have autonomous closed-loop thermal control to survive through the night. Okay. On top of it, it has to be standalone and autonomous in that we, it has solar panels to uh, collect solar energy, have batteries uh, to store the energy, and have enough energy and control the energy cycle for survival through the night and for flight through the air. So uh, such a vehicle uh, has to be all done under 1.8 kilogram. Okay. So the first, okay, we'll talk about the 1.8 kilogram in a few minutes. The first question you must have that we certainly had and all the people who wouldn't believe our team about a year and a half or two ago is, can you really fly a rotorcraft in thin atmospheric density? Okay, so the first thing we did uh, last year was build a prototype of the rotor system, this again 1.2 meter diameter rotor system with the airfoil and the twist and the core distribution um, optimized for lift and uh, fluid uh, with onboard sensors <laughs> Uh, autonomously uh, in a space simulator chamber at JPL. So we pump the chamber out to vacuum, backfilled with carbon dioxide to get the right uh, gas composition, and then uh, flew the helicopter autonomously. So I'd like to share the video of our flight demonstration. So here's our 1.2 meter uh, rotor system here. It's spinning up to uh, 2600 RPM. This is all autonomous. It has been commanded to spin up to 2,600 RPM and then ascend autonomously. So there's no uh, human in the loop. And hover for 30 seconds and then descend on the So at this point, it's using the onboard IMUs and then there are fiducials that we're tracking uh, from the cameras. The camera information and the IMU data are being used to real-time estimate the state of the vehicle and is controlling the vehicle position and the attitude. The side-to-side -side motion is from this 1% atmosphere really getting stirred up, hitting the walls, and coming back and posing its wind to the vehicle. This was a huge uh, accomplishment uh, that convinced everybody, convinced a sponsor uh, and, and, and uh, you know, the naysayers that it is possible to uh, fly a rotorcraft at Mars autonomously. You do need uh, closed loop uh, autonomous uh, control uh, with onboard uh, sensing and control. So since then, uh, we have uh, gone to the next step of addressing the 1.8 kilograms. Uh, we have designed a system uh, that is uh, just under 1.8 kilograms that contains the eff effective uh, solar uh, panels, the batteries, uh, very lightweight uh, avionics for communication control, uh, onboard sensors, and uh, rotor system. And so uh, keep an eye, eye out for us. Uh, we will be repeating this demonstration that you saw within the next uh, two months. So.
All right. Um, uh, there's a lot more I want to say, but I think we'll wait till the discussion. One thing I'd like to say is this vehicle uh, at 1.8 kilogram with this kind of capability uh, would not have been possible 15 years ago. It's really from the advancement of lightweight capable avionic sensors, you know, high efficient batteries and solar cell conversions that we're able to do such a thing today. So I'd like to Great, more. thank you. So what's the 1.8 uh, limitation? Why, why is it? So uh, because of the thin atmosphere, uh, it is hard to achieve lift at Mars. So that's the primary limitation. So when you take a rotor that size, so it all starts from the initial size that we picked. Got it. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. And uh, when you say there's no ability to have joystick control, you're talking about autonomous control. Is there any control over that device when it's on Mars, or has this all got to be predetermined? Meaning, uh, is there any outside control? Is there any NASA control over this device once it's there? Uh, so the control is in a more remote manner. So ahead of time, we have to send the command to the helicopter saying, at this time, wake up and then fly, take off, follow these waste waypoints, and then land. And then communicate back to us, send the images that you've taken from the spacecraft, and then wait for us to tell you again what to do. So you can get messaging to it from Earth? Yes. To, yes we How can. long does that take? Uh, the one-way lifetime, anywhere from four minutes to 21 Got minutes. It. Okay. And normally, to, it could be to a, some sort of a base station. It Got could it. be a rover, a base station, an orbiter that tells it ahead of time. Got it. Okay, excellent. Um, I'm going to ask you all uh, what the... Uh, timelines to some landmark, some milestone that you see in your area look like and what the greatest impediments are to getting there. Hmm. And I don't know what it looks like. In other words, in your world, it may mean a certain percentage of autonomous vehicles or some kind of milestone. But what milestone should we be looking at? Sure. For uh, self-driving passenger vehicles, the public perception is that, hey, uh, vehicles are going to be fully autonomous, uh, you don't, do not need to be sitting in the driver's seat, you could be actually sitting in the back seat, taking a nap, uh, playing with your kids and so on. So that is kind of the holy grail of the domain. And then I guess uh, there are uh, different schools of thought about the timeline. There are companies even today who claim that they likely full, have full autonomy in 2018. I'm not holding my breath and I don't, I don't think anybody should. And there are people actually who claim that it's going to take more than 60 years, several decades. I am the camp that is going to take at least a decade, if not longer. I think what is happening, what will be happening is basically is that, as I mentioned, you can buy today vehicles basically which can uh, uh, warn you if your vehicle is actually drifting away from your lane. It can basically even nudge you back into the, into the lane, even if it's actually curving, not a strong curvature, but a reasonable curvature that can keep you in the lane. It can actually help you uh, self-park. It can basically give you alerts for cross-traffic alert, uh, for uh, blind zone alerts, and so on. So incremental automation is the way I think uh, likely things will happen. Uh, the Society for Automotive Engineers has defined uh, five levels of automation, level one through five. Level one is full uh, manual uh, operation. Level five is fully autonomous operation and different uh, degrees. Uh, for example, uh, as a point of uh, calibration, the autopilot that Tesla has in uh, Model S and so on, Model X, uh, that is level two. And then uh, GM just released a feature called Super Cruise on their flagship model, the Cadillac uh, CT6. And that, I believe, is actually a more safe, uh, safer, more robust uh, implementation of vehicle uh, uh, driving itself only on the highways is also level two. So, so to me, it's going to take at least uh, 10 years to basically get to uh, level five, but we'll get level three and level four in well-constrained, geographically controlled environments where you can control pedestrian traffic, no pedestrians, no bicycles, and then the like. And over time, it's going to take uh, uh, many more years for full autonomy. And I'll add that that's in a country like the US where the driving etiquette more or less is pretty good. Right? So take a country like uh, Indonesia or India, Pakistan, and so on, it's going to take much, much longer. <laughs> He's safe saying that. Um, <laughs> I have to say what I love about this world of engineering is that in my normal world, I ask highly specific questions and people give me very vague answers. <laughs> and here I, I sort of toss out a relatively vague question and I get a really specific answer. I really, <laughs> I kind of enjoy that, thank you. Um, you, are, you are all very exact. 
But that's the best answer I've had on that uh, ever. Uh, James, to the same question, I want to uh, add another uh, element to it, and that is, um, are we looking for passenger transport in the robotics that we're looking for in the ocean? Um, or is it mainly a research uh, enterprise? Well, so, so, so in, in many respects in the ocean environment, it's actually not that dissimilar from space. Uh, you know, humans are expensive. Uh, they're, they're very expensive uh, to ensure their safety at a water depth, say, of 6,000 meters, where you have 10,000 pounds per square inch externally. It, and it means, it means you build a very large, uh, complex platform supported by a fairly sophisticated surface vessel and a group of individuals who really don't do anything else other than operate, the, operate that platform. So in a lot of respects in the ocean environment, a lot of what you see emerging is emerging industries, uh, whether it's oil and gas, uh, what, you know, revolutions in, uh, in defense uh, going on right now, those largely come from taking the person out of the platform. And, uh, and so, in fact, the question then is different than the one I asked Raj, because you, your milestones are not as uh, obvious as, as if you're trying to get passengers to sit in the back seat of their car and have the car drive them around. Well, so I, I would give an example of a milestone in our world would be to be able to do deep water survey without a ship at all. And so let me give you an example. Um, uh, when the Air France was uh, lost in the, in the middle of the Atlantic, uh, it was, there were several searches. The search that ultimately found it used robots. Uh, so it had three robots, actually. So it was a group at Woods Hole that, that did this search. Now, those robots searched the uh, seafloor, I want to say, somewhere around seven to ten times faster than you would do it with just the ship alone, right. to towing in a piece of equipment behind it. And so they, they found it, and they found it actually fairly quickly, but you still had the ship out there. So the early versions of what we did with robots in the sea made the ship more productive, right? That very expensive platform, we made it uh, produce data, more, value, uh, more valuable data. Now, imagine, imagine uh, the Malaysian airliner, which uh, went down uh, presumably somewhere in uh, the Indian Ocean. Now you've got humans out there on ships uh, being beat up. That's a tough ocean to operate in. Our maps suck, right? I mean, the first robot that you got put in the water there, by the way, produced by my old company, uh, they put it out in water depth that was uh, a kilometer deeper than they, thought it, uh, than they thought it was. So, you know, we just, we just kind of didn't know what was out there. So for years, right, you have people out there on ships serving, uh, ser uh, searching the, the seafloor for that aircraft. I maintain that that should have been done entirely by robots by a combination of autonomous surface craft and then autonomous underwater vehicles. Now they're, you communicate with them from shore, um, but you don't have people at sea. And, and there's different ways that you design that. The system engineering of these we understand pretty well, the pieces of it we have. Uh, it's a matter of kind of putting it all together uh, in an integrated framework and then working out the bugs. And those things aren't cheap. Uh, you know, as a, an economic driver comes along, uh, it will be done. Uh, and I don't know whether that occurs in two years or five years or ten years, but uh, you know, basically the technology. So you've, you've is ready named to do two now. areas that obviously we're very concerned about: uh, search and rescue, uh, airplane crashes. The other one that comes to my mind is the Deepwater Horizon. Yeah. Um, so another project we're working on revolves around oil spills in the Arctic. So if you look at Deepwater Horizon, uh, that could not have occurred, and don't get me wrong, but this occurred in the most convenient place on the planet it could have, right? You're a day steam from a number of ports with all of the hardware and equipment necessary for working in the deep ocean. And how long did it take us to even figure out how much oil was coming out of the seafloor and much less stop it? Quite a while. You know, imagine what happens in the Arctic. As the Arctic opens up, there's more and more human activity up there. And I think a lot of people think that the first accidents up there will probably be ships running aground in waters which are very poorly charted. And so now the Coast Guard has to respond in a place where they have no response capability. And so now you, what you want, what we think of it as the last seat in the helicopter uh, uh, problem, a friend of mine, Chris Reddy, uh, coined that term. So you want a really small robot which you can get out there, which gives the first responders a situational awareness of the oil spill so that when they're, as they're mobilizing uh, to get their equipment out there, they know what to pack and they know what to take and they know what the priorities are and they know how much oil's in the water and, uh, and, where, and where it's going. So these are the types of things that, that we're grappling with. Uh, there's no silver bullet underwater vehicle that solves all problems. There's a lot of very special 
uh, specially designed systems for, for different applications in the ocean environment, which is not surprising. Terrestrial yeah. environment, air environment, space environment, same way. All right. Um, Claire, let's talk a little, I, I, I'm, you gave me a lot of insight uh, in your presentation there, which makes me now wonder what the goal is in, uh, in autonomy in air. And, and it could be defense, it could be better air traffic control, or more efficient, it could be uh, greater safety in aircraft. Uh, and of course, with air travel, you have the nifty factor, right? It's like cars. Well, there are there, there's actually probably some commercial interest in um, in in figuring out autonomous uh, uh, air travel in a greater way, and then there's obviously the commercial value of Amazon dropping stuff wherever you need it to be or whatever the case is. So, give me a sense of the milestones you're looking at, and and specifically tell me why you started with air, air traffic control. Is that to you the most important uh, goal? Why I started this presentation yeah. or why I started my career? Um, <laughs> I think because... Yes, they're both, but, uh, but this presentation. I wouldn't have guessed that that's where you'd have started the presentation. So tell me what drives that. Air traffic control has been there for a long time. I mean, it's... Uh, it's and, and all of the other um, pieces of the system, like putting UAVs into the system or even these new um, electric vehicles, uh, they're going to have to figure out their airspace operations and that's going to have to be done with air traffic control. And I think that the, um, you know, the, when I'm thinking about the milestones, it's, I would say it's not so, um, it's not so clear cut because there has been automation that's been introduced into the system gradually from the time it started. I think that, um, you know, people like to say, well, when will we have um, uh, commercial aircraft that don't have pilots? Um, will we see FedEx jets taking off um, that, that don't have pilots? And my feeling is that for the foreseeable future, we're gonna have pilots. We're gonna have certified pilots in these aircraft. But the automation, I mean, there's all sorts of wonderful automation going on. It's a really wonderful control problem. Um, there's, um, there's now automatic communication between aircraft. So what, what is basically done over voice now is going to, there's new data link, there's new, um, there's new communication protocols that will enable some autonomous operation. Um, and in fact, the automation on board the aircraft has really reduced the number of pilots that have to be there in the cockpit flying the aircraft. I, I feel that with air traffic control, the, um, you know, with the air traffic controllers and the pilots in the, and the, the people who are in the aircraft, there, there's, there's always going to be a human that's fairly closely embedded in the loop there. Where the autonomous operations, I think, are really, um, are really going to be pushing are, are with these new vistas, like UAVs and, and really kind of integrating UAVs into the airspace system. Right now, people can fly UAVs around, and, and actually, with the FAA, it's been a very fast moving for the FAA um, time, because just over the past two years, there's been a, a series of new regulations that have opened up and, and sort of are out there for people to use and comment on, on how um, UAVs should be introduced into the airspace system. But basically, it's separated. The UAVs are flying in a different airspace than are the, um, you know, the general aviation aircraft and the commercial jets. They're, they're generally lower. They're generally lower. Right. And um, now, I mean, the, the sort of general airspace that, that are kind of just around us, Class G airspace, you can do a lot in that airspace without even having to register your UAV if it's small enough. Um, I think where the, a big question comes up is, is in these, these personal air vehicles. There's been a lot of sort of media about them. And I think the thing that's sort of the sticking point is they want to fly them without a commercial pilot. And I think that's gonna take a while. So this is the concept of my buying a flying car and being able to want to fly it around because I'm a, because I have a driver's license. That's right. I think that to do that, what, what is going to happen, I think they're going to be, I mean, the companies are building them and people want them, um, but, but to be able to fly one of those, at least for the foreseeable future, um, there has to be a certified pilot. There will have to be a certified pilot. And We're not going to skip right to the idea that there are flying cars that fly us around. I, I don't believe so. I believe that, the, um, that we may get to the point at some point where they are autonomous. They, I mean, they are, bu they are built, the, the vehicles that I showed are built to be autonomous. Um, but I believe that there will be um, 
at least for the foreseeable future, there'll be a, a pilot on board. And while we're in the midst of this conversation nationally about the privatization of air traffic control, it's strange if one doesn't follow this closely, uh, you can find opinions on entirely opposite sides of this, that our air traffic control system is antiquated and very broken, and our air tra traffic control system is really good and stops accidents from happening, keeps planes separated very effectively, which is true. I think, I think you know, both are true. The, um, no, it's the, the air traffic control system, a lot of the equipment is very antiquated. The computer systems, the, I mean, to certify something that's gonna be in use in air traffic control takes a long time. And as a result, the, um, the kind of technologies and the algorithms and the, um, some of the actual hardware is, is old hardware, um, but it's been certified. Um, I think that the, um, the system is a very safe system, and that's a combination of things. It's somehow the computer systems being old makes it a little more secure um, in these days, um, which is an interesting point in itself. <laughs> I think that the, um, the people in the loop make it safe. So air traffic controllers, and I've spent a lot of time sitting with air traffic controllers and watching what they do in all sorts of different spaces. They um, they spend their lifetime on a sector of airspace. And they know that sector of airspace like the back of their hand. And, so, and they've seen all sorts of different configurations of weather or disturbances, and they know how to deal with that. And it's, it, on United, you used to be able to listen into air traffic right, control. Yeah, channel now, nine. Yeah, channel nine. And it's kind of life affirming when you listen to them because it's a, such a nice conversation that's going back and forth and you feel comfortable in the hands of, of these people that know the system so well. I think there is, until we can um, bring that into automation, that human component that really, you know, they'll do anything to save an aircraft is, it, we don't know how to automate that. I'm, I'm a really nerdy guy. Uh, I have an app where I, when I sit at airports, I can listen to the ATC yeah. there and just listen, watching it and, and hearing what's going on. It is, it's life affirming, but it's a lot more complicated than it looks like a few planes riding around. Oh, completely. Um, if you just think about the tower as air traffic control and not all of the centers that exist across the US and, and what they do and their procedures, and it's, it's a very complicated system. Mimi, let's talk about, uh, I think this is the one I understand the least, the milestones in, in your world, because uh, you are working on things I didn't know it was capable of working on. So I don't know what the future looks like to you and what the uh, impediments are to getting where you need to get. Sure, so in space, uh, I think Raj used the term, things are incremental. Um, when we talked about autonomy in space, we tend to be on the primitive side of autonomy as opposed to, I think there are two sides, right? Making things happen that we want to happen without us being there, mm -hmm. right? We're in that world as opposed to, I think there's a second kind of autonomy here, which is the decisions and what should this car do or what should this vehicle do? So on the side of making uh, things happen uh, in space, there is so much more to go and there are many ideas and it's a matter of time and opportunity to do it. For example, when I show the autonomous landing of the rover, that was a soft landing. It was the first you know, soft landing we did of a large vehicle. The next level we will be is precision landing, right? So maybe get land exactly within uh, you know, less than a kilometer of the targeted area instead of you know, a few kilometers from where we intended to be, which is the state of the art today. Um, the other kind of uh, milestone would be to go closer to uh, planetary bodies, uh, like small bodies, and uh, you know, do sample, uh, pick up samples, and uh, return samples from comets, right? So it's really uh, getting close to targets in space, and um, I guess stepping back a little bit, traditionally uh, we flew spacecraft, we launched them, and then we would orbit around planets with some three you know, uh, standard deviations away from being safe and you kind of explore remotely and observe, right? And then next we've gotten closer to bodies and we're landing on them. Next we want to land even more precisely or we wanna go up to small bodies, touch them. We want to fly in the air of uh, Mars atmosphere or there is Titan or you know, Venus that have atmosphere. So the milestones are just incremental capability in doing things in space. Um, and one of the impediments or challenges of doing that is in space autonomy, uh, the 
functions, these new things that we want to do in uh, space. We are not short of ideas. We're not short of technology. We know how to develop them. Uh, the first challenge is we are trying to get to places and study places where we've never been before. And that environment we can never reproduce in entirety on Earth. So while we're developing these technologies, the first time we get to really do it is when we get there. So uh, when we, Mars Curiosity you know, was being developed, uh, some of the guys working on the field test of this landing said, well, our real field test is gonna be when we land, the day we land on Mars, right? So it's that kind of, uh, so because we cannot reproduce it like the Mars helicopter that I showed just now, I showed a demo uh, where we have a chamber with thin air, but we couldn't really simulate simultaneously the less, the lower gravity, and the dynamics that are involved. You know, we can't scale the size and the gravity and the atmospheric density all at the same time. So we have to simulate and do partial test verification and validation of it. And all that, uh, we, are, we know how to do it, but it takes time and it takes money. And our opportunities of trying these out in space are far and few in between and they're expensive. So not short of ideas, not short of what we want to do, uh, time and money. So, so I just came from uh, the X Prize annual event, which you know it was really uh, born out of the idea of uh, raising money exponentially for for space travel. This is of a different, you know, this is in a different category of space travel. There's a Google Lunar X Prize out there. Wh where does slash should uh, the money that you need for this come from? With, with these other areas, uh, we can see where there can be some commercial slash governmental uh, money that makes sense. Uh, obviously, historically, NASA has been the logical place for this. But when we are talking about the kind of money that we're going to need to be talking about, what are your what's your what's your longer term thinking on this? Is this a revitalized NASA that continues to pay for this? Is there a reason to get uh, big? big money commercial partners into it? Is it defense? Is it technology? Is it Google's? Is it Northrop Grumman's? What is it? Um, just my opinion, I think we need the Model T of automobile in space. So, you know, Model T came along and it became a car that enabled uh, in every household uh, to be able to buy a car. And then more people bought cars and it became an economy. And so today, fundamentally, uh, spacecraft are expensive. Uh, it's not a profitable area. And so I believe that there has to be global, you know, with human beings uh, personally interested uh, so that these technologies uh, advance uh, in a high rate uh, towards uh, lower mass, uh, lower volume, lower power consumption, and fundamentally the low cost. So that's why when I gave the example of the Mars helicopter, uh, you know, just now, that it just couldn't have been done uh, 15 years ago. So the reason uh, we were able to achieve the 1.8 kilograms, we leveraged these more reliable, because in space you need reliability. In, in those distances, we can't go out and repair systems. So we have been uh, using very- There was a movie about that. Yes, <laughs> that, well, and <laughs> we can talk about that. There was a lot of wind on the Martian that I covered. My, our helicopter would love to fly in that kind of air that was in oh, yeah. the movie, by the way. So, <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, but really, these advancements of reliable computers, the inertial measurement units, the cameras that the automobile autonomous cars are, people are finally starting to care about reliability in the way that we've had to care because we always had just that one chance, right? In yeah. this seven year development or so, there is that one chance this spacecraft has to work. That kind of mentality I think is now coming in as human safety is starting to play. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very hopeful that that kind of almost a global economical tied into day-to-day -day use of people, I think that's what's gonna make the right technologies uh, advance forward. So for your purposes, reliability is paramount because if, it, if it's going to break or there's any chance it's gonna break, it, you've wasted everybody's money on this. Raj, we were having a funny a conversation, wasn't that funny, but in the back where, um, the, the argument that a lot of people who are proponents of uh, autonomy in cars 
is that it will be safer. And I think safer is a broad term. In your world, you're talking about faster and more reliable. Safer is abs uh, an abstraction, I think, is the impression I got. Uh, yes, let's, let's, talk, let's talk, talk through this. Uh, as I mentioned, 1.3 million people die every year uh, globally due to automotive crashes, and 94% uh, of those uh, crashes happen due to human error. Right? We humans are uniquely conditioned to be distracted. Right? When that smartphone rings when you're driving, you know that you should not pick it up. Guess what? Pretty much all of us do. Right? <laughs> Uh, just the way we are built, right? So that's, uh, we, we know better, we can do better kind of a thing. And then I guess so we actually are uh, draw, we are intoxicated, uh, drugged, uh, angry, road rage comes in, and uh, we are distracted looking at things and we run into people and so on. Uh, so I guess we are, we are the problem, right? Uh, so instead, basically, computers are paying attention, they are paying attention all the time. I guess uh, they are not going to be distracted, and therefore, they will be reacting in situations that you, where you may not, could be at late at night uh, when you're drowsy and so on, the vehicles will pay attention. So that is the safety argument. And 1.3 million uh, losses every year is basically a huge loss to society, so it'll be a huge benefit at large. On the flip side of the equation, however, uh, this is a, a remarkable number to keep in mind. Uh, we have about uh, 36,000 people dying in the U.S. from automotive crashes every year. Right? If you basically, I guess, map that to the number of miles being driven, uh, it turns out that a fatality happens every 75 or so million miles of driving. Think about that. 75 million miles of driving, one person dies. Right? It's a remarkably high bar for, even for technology. Right? It's going to take quite some time to basically get there, even in a country like the U.S. I'll take other countries that I mentioned before, it's going to take uh, much, much longer because there is really no driving etiquette, uh, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> So, so then the question basically becomes, so actually give a, so take any of these environments uh, by and large, they are relatively controlled, particularly air traffic control, basically a plane is basically given uh, uh, an altitude to cruise at, basically the trajectory to follow, and basically this huge buffer zone between planes and so on, and then the human basically takes over uh, during takeoff, uh, during landing and so on. So the autopilot, which has been around for like 25 years or so, basically happens in extremely controlled situations, right? But we basically map that uh, to, to the uh, ground surface, basically unlimited uh, 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 things can actually happen in the environment, uh, all sorts of crazy things. You can basically have a construction zone where people are moving around, basically a barrier is falling over. You can basically have an accident that may have occurred before you got there. You can actually have heavy snow, heavy rain, uh, heavy fog, and so on. You need to deal with basically an, basically an unlimited number of scenarios. And uh, the, the software technology that we have today can be tested, uh, can be verified in relatively small number of uh, those conditions. So uh, the largest set basically is going to be an unlimited set. It's going to be a while before we can basically make this assertion or guarantee that the, the vehicle will be safe under all conditions. So you should basically take a simple scenario. You're driving along in an urban setting, and basically there's a whole bunch of complex things that are happening in the environment, right? So software, all you, the simple thing that you can do is slow down and stop. Everybody is safe, right? Except that at that point in time, you basically the vehicle in front of you basically stops at everything that happens out there. Today, you would be honking, right? You'd be a hand, using hand gestures and so on, <laughs> right? And if every autonomous vehicle out there is doing this, you'll basically say, ah, this is useless technology, right? Now, basically, map that same scenario to the highway. Something is going on. You think there is a, a, a kid on the road because perception basically gave you a, a false positive. The vehicle comes down and comes to a stop. It's safe for the vehicle, but that could be an 18-wheeler behind you, <laughs> which cannot and therefore will not stop. It's not a safe situation to be in, right? So you might say, hey, why don't I program this vehicle to basically pull off onto the side of the road to the shoulder? Great, but it turns out that instead of the shoulder just ended, a bridge just began, so basically you'll run into a column, right? <laughs> you could actually go a step beyond. There is no shoulder. And there's basically a huge cliff down there. So it turns out that for any scenario, any uh, safety measure you can put in, you can actually come up with a counterexample as well. So the real world that we operate in is extremely complex. So I think, as I said before, or as we are alluding to, incremental automation, where the environment is controlled, where we can basically uh, determine who is there, who is not there, and all the vehicles basically have similar capabilities, we can do some very reasonable things in the near future. But basically, completely open it up, no constraints at all, lots of things can go wrong. Interesting, all right.
Thank you. Um, Claire, let me ask, you alluded to the idea that in air traffic control, the idea that there are some old computers uh, is not a bad thing. Uh, to Raj's point right now, uh, one makes me, uh, it makes me think when we're talking about air or we're talking about land, that the, uh, the things we have to think about in terms of hacking are serious. Uh, in your opinion, is the right thought going into that? Um, I think it's a very complicated problem um, because sort of like I said before, but now it's malicious that you, you can't predict um, the, the kinds of things that people might be trying to do. Well, in some sense you could try to predict, but I think for every prediction there's somebody that does something that you didn't expect would happen. I think that, um, for example, as soon as aircraft start to rely on GPS, even an augmented GPS, like a wide area, local area augmentation system for GPS, you know, then you're subject to hacking of the GPS and, um, or hacking of the sensor on board that, that's using the GPS that could make the aircraft, you know, want to land in a place when it was supposed to fly. So, so I think it's, there is, um, there is quite a lot of attention being um, paid uh, within, air traffic control, and I, in the meetings that I've been in, I, it's, it's where I hear the kind of fallback that, well, you know, in our critical decision making, we're not relying on, on an autonomous functionality for that, and it, it, it provides some sense of safety because there's, there, I mean, I, I sort of said it tongue in cheek, but it is true, some of the, 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 the I mean, it's old technology in terms of the computers and the networking, um, but ultimately, it's, it's the human in the loop, it's the person that's watching what all the aircraft are doing that um, it starts to question if something looks like, it, like an aircraft is going where it shouldn't be going because somebody is hacking into the system. So both of you are of the view that even in an environment where you're, you, you've studied this more than the rest of us who love the idea of autonomy, both of you seem to be of a view that we uh, shouldn't be too excited about getting humans out of the process when it comes to autonomy on land and sea. Am I reading that correctly? Yes, well, at least for me. It's going to take, take time. So I guess uh, limited deployment, uh, incremental deployment where the human is still in the loop is necessary, as uh, Claire said, in the foreseeable Because in your case, you're talking about an entire, to, to make it completely autonomous, where everything can ride on its own without human intervention, you'd have to have infrastructure changes. You'd have to have the road telling you that this is a cliff or this is a shoulder or whatever the case is. In other words, there'd have to be an internet of everything, uh, internet of things component to feeding into this. It, it's not just the decision that the car is making. So good, so I, to, to me, uh, Ali, I think you raise two fundamental uh, uh, observations about the domain. Uh, the first is basically, I guess, uh, what should the vehicle assume about the infrastructure? Uh, turns out that, again, there are uh, two uh, schools of thought. The first is embodied by uh, companies like uh, Google. You cannot and should not expect that the government will basically invest to basically make the infrastructure be more intelligent, so the traffic lights tell you what their status is, other vehicles tell you who they are, where they are, and so on. Uh, and therefore, basically, a uh, company like Google with its deep pocket says, I will build in all the necessary smarts, sensors into my vehicle, and therefore, it does not need to count on anybody else. And uh, that, I guess, uh, so we are making progress, but it's going to take time. Uh, conversely, if basically the infrastructure does become smart, you will be able to actually see the traffic lights very reliably, even when the sun is low on the horizon right behind the traffic light, where even humans will actually have a hard time. And then basically around a blind corner, if the vehicle like basically wirelessly communicates to you and say, I mean, coming uh, to the intersection will be possibly be colliding, that actually makes the whole uh, uh, system a lot more, uh, a lot safer and more reliable. So that I refer to as connected automation, where basically connectivity with the environment along with local centers makes the system a lot more robust. So I think so that's basically one piece of the puzzle. The other piece that you're alluding to, I think is really uh, needs to be paid a lot, more, a lot more attention to is the security challenge, if you will, uh, cyber attacks and such. I guess, unfortunately, I guess uh, we know uh, some of these attacks that have been happening in Europe where a vehicle basically literally mows down people. Right? So the, the knee struck and then in Britain and so on. Now we imagine that basically a self-driving vehicle is basically taken over by a terrorist and basically starts, there's nobody to shoot at either. It just basically willy-nilly actually hits people and so on. 
Now basically scale that to 100 vehicles or 1,000 vehicles in the city all of a sudden going crazy, causing chaos throughout the city, right? Now imagine that scaling to an entire country and then globally as well, right? That would be the ultimate uh, chaos situation around the planet with self-driving cars. So it turns out that uh, people in the domain are extremely aware of this uh, possibility that uh, if somebody outside maliciously or otherwise is able to basically take over control, really, really bad things can happen. Right? So therefore, uh, uh, much more often than uh, before, uh, people are paying a lot more attention about, hey, if the vehicle is being told to basically drive at a certain speed, should it be driving at that uh, speed or not? Right? So basically, you need to basically have uh, significant research happening. This is not just a, a cyber security problem. This is what we refer to as a cyber physical security problem as well, where basically if a command comes in, you need to basically validate, hey, I am in an urban area. I see obstacles around me. Why am I being commanded to be driving at 50 miles per hour? Right? Why am I being commanded to basically go over the curb? It basically means that you need to basically have a local, safe, secure, and safe system out here, and there is a system telling you what to do, and these two need to be uh, separated, and meanwhile, this has to be really be known to be extremely robust. Right. So there are sort of challenges ahead. But just, just to say one more thing about the human in the loop, it doesn't have to be in the traditional sense that it is now. Um, so, you know, the personal air mobility, uh, it could be a pilot that's on the ground that's watching that aircraft. So there's, you're driving in your car and you're, you take off, but there is, there is some kind of certified pilot, which is how they fly a lot of the large UAVs now. There's a certified pilot on the ground who's flying that the aircraft. military UAVs are often flown that way. Yeah. Right? There's an actual pilot. Um, James, let me ask you something, just to change gears for a second before we go uh, for a quick break. You said that folks should ask about ocean worlds. So I'm going to ask about ocean worlds. Ocean what worlds, What on yeah. earth is an ocean? What's not on earth? Right. So, so I, think, uh, I think that, in a way, one of the more exciting stories of, of the last several decades really revolves around the discovery that uh, the, the world, our Earth, is not the only planet with oceans. And so this was two key discoveries, both of which occurred in the, the late 70s. Uh, one was uh, as the Voyagers uh, were launched and, and flew through the Jovian system and saw Europa with uh, its ice surface uh, kind of missing craters. Uh, and pretty much everything that's been around in our solar system for a while has craters on it unless something removed it. And it was an icy world, and the suspicion was, was that maybe, maybe that ice surface was active, maybe there was something liquid under it. Uh, since then, we've realized there's many more moons uh, out there, Enceladus, uh, you know, as you even go further out, you know, maybe even Pluto, you know, has, uh, has liquid under it. And subsequent measurements seem to indicate that this is, in fact, a salty ocean uh, in Europa and probably in Enceladus as well. Enceladus actually is around Saturn and has geysers. And, uh, and the other discovery really was that uh, this discovery of hydrothermal vents. You know, so we used to think that, that where you found oceans was in the Goldilocks zone, right? You know, you weren't too close to the sun and uh, it didn't boil off and you weren't too far away and it got frozen up. Well, it turns out that, you know, orbiting around Jupiter or Saturn generates enough tidal stresses on these little satellites that it heats them from within. And so there's probably hydrothermal vents under there. And we know on Earth that we have life that, that exists without... Uh, without uh, dependence on the sun. So the question is, is on these, on these icy moons, is there life there? It's probably our best chance to find life in the solar system. And of course, you know, if we find life in the solar system in a second place, that means that life is far more likely uh, uh, in our galaxy and in the universe than, uh, uh, than we think. So it, it's a grand adventure. It's also sort of, uh, you can kind of think of it also a little bit like our, un, our, our realization that the Earth is not the center, right? You know, as, as you kind of moved, uh, you know, uh, you know that the, the, sun, the sun doesn't revolve around us. You know, we revolve around the sun. You know, we used to think we were just the only place with an ocean, and uh, we're not. Uh, we're not. And these very different oceans probably have a lot to teach us about our oceans here uh, on Earth. So it's an exciting time. There's missions that are gonna go there. It's, uh, you know, maybe our grandkids will be the ones who actually figure this all out. Uh, but I think there's no question that, that uh, and it'll be done by robots, <laughs> uh, very clever so robots. I, from all my space people tell me, uh, ironically, that we probably have a better uh, understanding of space than we do the deep ocean. 
Um, and, and part of the issue is expressing to people what the imperative is. So with the other three categories here, we figured out the various imperatives. Yeah. With, with ocean, the imperatives are pretty clear. The health of the ocean for one and the food that we get from it being the other. Um, and yet, for some reason, I'm sure it's captured your imagination, those of your colleagues very well. My sense is that it has not captured the global imagination the same way. We don't fundamentally understand the dangers of not understanding the map yeah. of the ocean. Yeah. Uh, we don't fundamentally understand the dangers of species being lost and, and of uh, pollution. Yeah, I, no, I think uh, uh, so true. Uh, yeah, and yes, in the oceanographic community, we scratch over our, our heads over this all the time. Uh, you know, if you look at the climate system, which part of the climate system do we really not understand? Well, the ocean. Uh, we don't understand the ocean. Half the oxygen we breathe comes from the forests of the ocean, which are the phytoplankton. Uh, this is actually one of the grand challenges of this century, is to kind of unravel what those little critters are doing. Uh, they come and go, they self-organize, they're far more uh, numerous and varied than you would sort of at first theoretically expect. Uh, and so we've been running actually a lot of the most exciting to me uh, uh, robotic experiments we've been running have revolved around attempting to understand the dynamics of uh, this, this uh, biological ocean. But you know, commercially as well, as you run out of terrestrial resources, where do you go? You go to the ocean environment. Uh, you know, as the developing world uh, increases its wealth, what's the first thing they spend their money on? It's protein. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to eat meat. Uh, you know, meat in, produced in the terrestrial environment tends to be, tends to be not so environmentally friendly. Uh, wild fisheries, uh, we're doing a pretty good job of fishing down. So we think about aquaculture as a way that maybe sort of provides uh, provides that food source for what is a growing population on our planet. And again, this sort of comes back to, uh, back to understanding how to use the ocean responsibly, understanding this environment, uh, getting a baseline, uh, uh, and being able to make you know, some moderate predictions about what's going to happen next. And in the result, uh, as a result, for example, of policies or economic investments, it's pretty essential, actually. Uh, and we're pretty far behind on it. Mimi, to, uh, same question to you, although it, it, space has captured the imagination differently, so uh, people sort of inherently see uh, the value in what you're doing, but what is the imperative? Why, why do it? Why figure Mars out better than we know now? I think it's along the way that Jim uh, explained. I think really understanding the fundamental question, right? Where do we come from and are we alone? really understanding the world of it. I think that's the fundamental drive for deep space. Um, All, right. All right, this is gonna be a great time for us to take a short break. I'm gonna ask you this. I know uh, everybody's gonna be very determined and focused. Um, can we be back 